Though he doesn't have the name recognition of Rockefeller or Ford, Sam Walton was once one of the biggest names in business throughout the United States, becoming the richest man in America by 1985. Despite rocky beginnings of being drafted into the military during World War II, being told that he wasn't cut out for retail by his boss at J.C. Penney, and even having his first business stolen by his landlord, Walton persisted through failure, eventually coming to create the internationally known brand Walmart. His story is one of perseverance, betrayal, and the determination to cling to the somewhat counterintuitive idea of increasing profits by reducing profit margins. This is the story of Sam Walton and Walmart, and this is Learn Something New. Samuel Moore Walton was born on a farm in Kingfisher, Oklahoma on March 29, 1918. As early as age 7, he was already taking on work, selling magazine subscriptions, and worked his way through college by doing newspaper delivery routes. He began what would become a lifelong career in the retail store business in 1940 when he took a job as a sales trainee at a J.C. Penney store in Des Moines, Iowa. Walton was enthusiastic about this job, but he was never one of the J.C. Penney company's most thorough employees. He hated to make customers wait while he worked around with paperwork, so his books were often a complete mess. His boss even threatened to fire him, saying that he was just not cut out for retail work. But Walton was saved constantly by his ability as a salesman, raking in about $25 per month in commissions in addition to his beginner salary. From there, he would jump through a few more jobs, including one as a worker at a DuPont gunpowder plant, which you can learn more about in my video covering DuPont's inception. It was here that he would meet his future wife, Helen Robson, marrying her on Valentine's Day 1943, just a few months after he was drafted into the United States Army. In the military, Walton served stateside as a communications officer in the Army Intelligence Corps for the complete duration of World War II. By the time he was released from the Army in 1945, Walton had his wife, Helen Walton, and a child to support, so he decided to forge his own path, putting up $5,000 of his own money and $20,000 that he borrowed from his father-in-law. And so, at the age of 27, Walton purchased a Ben Franklin variety store in Newport, Arkansas. This was a sort of small general store that sold an assortment of items, and the one that he had bought had been in a bad condition, and he had overpaid for the franchise. But through hard work, long hours, and a policy of pricing products well below that of what other retailers were willing to charge, Walton soon tripled his business, and by 1950, he owned the leading Ben Franklin store in a six-state region. But then, it all went wrong. You see, the store's success was very apparent, especially to the store's landlord, who wanted to acquire the business for his son. Sam obviously had no intention of selling something he had just worked so hard to build back up, so the landlord simply refused to renew his lease, leaving him no other option than to give up the business. He would later say that this was a low point of his life. After setting down roots in Newport with his family and becoming a part of the community, he had suddenly just had the rug pulled out from underneath him. He decided to find a new place he could settle into. He searched rural towns around Little Rock, Arkansas for a new place to do business, and found the tiny community of Bentonville. It was there he set up a shop in the store on the town square, this time insisting on a 99-year lease with the landlord, and Walton opened Walton's Five and Dime in the summer of 1950. There were two other variety stores in town, but neither offered the consistently low prices that Walton did. As a result, the new enterprise quickly achieved the same success of his previous venture, prompting Walton to look for other such opportunities, though he would later claim that after what happened to his first store, he no longer wanted to have all of his eggs in one basket. Throughout the 1950s, using borrowed money and the profits from the store he had already owned, Walton acquired one variety store after another. By 1960, he owned 15 stores, but he wasn't seeing the profits he had expected, and thought he ought to be making more money for the kind of effort that he was putting in. He decided to adapt his strategy into dramatically cutting prices in the hopes of undercutting his competition and making up on the difference in price through a higher volume of sales. And this practice wasn't new by any means. At the time, so-called discount stores did exist, but they really only existed in large cities, and they tended to only discount certain specialty items. Walton's idea was to build big stores that discounted everything they stocked, and to place them in small towns. Initially, he approached the company that franchised the Ben Franklin stores with his idea, but the company directors loudly refused to back him when Walton explained that they would have to cut their standard wholesale margin in half to accommodate the low prices he intended to charge. 
So Walton decided to take the gamble himself, mortgaging his home and borrowing as much as anyone would be willing to lend to him. He opened his first Walmart with the help of his brother Bud Walton. Originally called Walmart Discount City, they opened their doors in 1962 in Rogers, Arkansas, not far from Bentonville. Walton wasn't alone in his venture into discounting, however. That very same year, Kmart and another large discounted retailer, Woolco, both launched and both of which could have easily crushed Walmart. But Walton was just too far off the beaten path to attract any attention from these retail giants. And thrilled that the big city New York discounting had come to small town America, rural customers flocked to Walton's stores and sales skyrocketed. This early success provided funding for further expansion, and by 1969, there were 18 Walmarts throughout Arkansas and Missouri. Until that time, Walton had funded expansion from profits and borrowing, but in 1970, he decided that he needed to take the company public if he was going to achieve the levels of growth that he knew he could reach. The initial offering generated nearly $5 million, and although Walton and his family retained 61% of ownership in the stock, the proceeds allowed him to pay off the company's debts and move forward with his ambitious expansion plans. In the first year after going public, Walmart added six stores, followed by 13 stores in each of the next two years, then 14, then 26. By the end of 1980, Walton had 276 stores and would soon be opening stores at a rate of about 100 per year. And in 1983, Walton launched the first Sam's Club, which was initially aimed at small business owners and others who wished to buy merchandise in bulk. Once again, Walton had struck gold with this idea, and in 1985, Forbes magazine pronounced him as the richest man in America, with an estimated net worth of 2.8 billion dollars. By 1987, Walmart had become the third largest retailer in the United States, only trailing to Sears and Kmart. At this point, his retail success was all but secured, so Walmart founder Sam Walton announced in 1988 that he was handing over the duties of CEO to Walmart executive David Glass, but would continue to serve as the chairman of the company. In that very same year, Walmart opened their Walmart Supercenter, similar to their regular stores but with the addition of a full-service supermarket. But just two years later, Walton was diagnosed with an aggressive strain of bone cancer, but even this dire pronouncement couldn't dampen his competitive spirit. At Walmart's annual meeting in June of 1990, Walton predicted that the company's revenue would quintuple to $125 billion within the next decade. Over the next two years, Walmart soared past Kmart and Sears to become the nation's largest retailer, and on March 17, 1992, President George H.W. Bush presented Walton with the Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor, for his entrepreneurial spirit and his concern for his employees and community. It would be his last achievement. Just a few days later, Walton checked into the University of Arkansas Hospital and passed away on April 5, 1992, just six days after his 74th birthday. At the time of his death, he had a net worth of nearly $25 billion, and his prediction of their revenue quintupling to $125 billion was a bit off the mark. Instead, Walmart hit $166 billion, surpassing his greatest expectations. Shortly after his passing, the University of Arkansas named their business college the Sam M. Walton College of Business in his honor. Sam Walton didn't invent retailing in the same way that Henry Ford didn't invent the first car. But just as Ford's assembly line revolutionized the American industry, Walton's pursuit of discounting revolutionized America's retail economy. Walton didn't just alter the way America shopped, he changed the philosophy of the American retail business establishment, instigating the shift of power from manufacturer to consumer consumer that has started to become more prevalent in industry after industry. Walmart has consistently been one of the top employers in the world since the year 1999, and has outpaced and even outlasted many of the companies that could have easily put him out of business during Walmart's inception. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I will see you in the next one.